So <clears throat> that's about as well as it uh, got, <laughs> got it to work so far. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, we are at Artificial Life Creation T plus 2, the multicellular menagerie. Uh, uh, the goals for today uh, was somatic cells, stick around, that's what we just saw not really happening. Uh, to get the first Living Computation Foundation book published, we'll talk about that, have more big fun. February was pretty busy, uh, and... <laughs> uh, uh, I, it, there was there was a lot of successes, but there was a lot of frustrations. I probably didn't stop and enjoy the fun as much as I should have. I have to keep working on that. Okay, so the schedule. Uh, last time, kill zombies, increased code density. Did pretty well with that. To this time, somatic cells, body cells. We sort of did that. We obviously uh, need what's coming up next: coordinated movement. Somatic cells. Any cell of a living organism other than the reproductive cells. Okay, now that's pretty obvious when you've got trillions of cells like one of us, but when you're down at the level of single cells or small collections, uh, the different distinction between reproductive cells and every other cell is not quite so clear, but exactly that's what we were trying to do with the fins on the fish. Uh, um, in uh, natural biology, uh, there are these cell adhesion molecules. I mean, there's been tons of, uh, art of Nobel Prizes awarded for people figuring out how cells interact with each other, intercellular interactions, recognition, communication, uh, uh, and how they exert forces on each other so that they can uh, stay together, uh, unlike uh, the fish that we've got so far. And, you know, the model that I'm using for that, or at least part of it, is this intercellular goo, which I said I would talk about this time, last time, and I'm still not going to talk about it a lot, but essentially what it is, is the uh, the diamonds that we had before, they sort of had this blue edge, and the new ones that you see uh, in the opening video, they have this kind of brown and yellow stuff around it. That's the intercellular goo, and part of its reason for existing is to create a bigger buffer so that we can be aware of other cells, rather than just trying to get so far away we can't see them at all because if we can't see them we can't communicate with them so we want to be close enough to have some kind of interaction while still having enough room to get away if things start going wrong so that's the intercellular goo that's going to have to develop a whole lot more than it has oh yeah and this was uh something that i made up ages ago when i was having some tweets with with michael levin uh, uh you know people tend to focus on the cells people tend to focus on the neurons uh, but really the intercellular interactions is so complicated complex and so powerful uh, that this is a little bit about what we're trying to do um, here. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, um, and my uh, stream deck is getting unreliable. I'm going to have to buy another one or do something else. Uh, uh, drivers and driving. So, you know, when we talk about distributed systems control, and folks like me who are doing this sort of bottom-up stuff uh, uh, are very anti-centralized, top-down, uh, uh, fixed control structures and all that, and want to have this distributed system control. But nonetheless, it's still going to be the case that, you know, if you want to get something done as a little collective group, there's going to have to be a single decision. And the classic example in the diamonds is growth and movement. Uh, if we're going to go east, we have to all go east. So there needs to be some centralized decision, some some decision held in common, however that is established. And, you know, in, in the way it actually comes down to it is that, you know, even though it's distributed system control, there is a point of centralization for any given decision point. The real question is, is that central point fixed by the architecture and never changes, or is it more fluid? Can it be here, there, or whatever? So in the case of the diamonds uh, that we've got, the, the diamond root, the, the uh, HG atom right in the center, uh, controls growth and movement, uh, uh, which makes sense because it takes signals in from all the edges about, you know, clearances and contacts, information from the goo, and, and it makes a decision and it broadcasts it out to the whole diamond and they all go one way or they get bigger, whatever it is. But once we have that uh, location where control happens, the controller can become the controlled. And that's what this driver is about. So now we've got this new API. I really want to call them API. So I really want to change the pronunciation of API to API, but it's another story. Uh, um, 
a new a new API call advise route that the, the diamond controller does. It looks around itself when it's time to make a decision about movement or growth, and it says, is there a controller nearby to advise me? And if it, if the uh, advise route returns false, then we just go ahead and do whatever we were doing before. Uh, um, so I used this diamond controller to uh, make a simple little driver for a diamond, and, and they are down here. So this is a comparative one. These things are identical until there's a reproduction. You will, probably won't be able to see it. There's a tiny little red dot here and over here next to the root in the ones on the bottom. Uh, uh, that is the controller that's getting the delegated from the root saying you want to do something. And what this controller says is if, if I am a right daughter, I want to go east, and if I am a left daughter, I want to go west so they spread out and look at this guy you know he he, he the being no, the, this being is, re, is really trucking now of course once we have a left order of a right order and a right order of a left order they're still pointing at each other but nonetheless these guys manage to distribute themselves a lot quicker uh, than the traditional <laughs> <laughs> less motivated, just sitting there vibing uh, uh, diamonds that we had before. So that's an example of what's going on. And the fins on the fish are using these drivers to try to stay uh, to uh, in the direction that which is where they thought the their their mother was. And now, of course, there's you know there's all kinds of troubles with that not working out. And uh, once again, I can't get back to my slides. Uh, uh, all right, there we go. Uh, big science. Uh, all right, much of what I spent the time on uh, uh, for the month of February was collecting data for the A Life paper for the A Life conference coming in June or something. Uh, um, <clears throat> that the paper deadline is March thirteenth. March 13th, the final extended, no more extensions, uh, uh, is six days from now. I got a lot of writing to do. But, you know, if it's going to be a paper at all, we, we have to do an experiment. We have to gather some data, do some kind of case study. So the run on the grid that we actually saw starting you know, last time in February has been going now for uh, almost 28 days, something like that. Uh, close, no, well, less than that, three weeks anyway, something. Uh, um, and so I, I wanted to reduce all that data and answer questions like how long do diamonds typically live? How many kids do they have? And so on. And the data to work with is the same data that we've been watching, the camera shots of the entire grid. So I spent a lot of time uh, uh, look learning about... Um, Python and OpenCV, Open Computer Vision, a big library, you know, and you see all these demos, um, you know, out in the world, full self-driving, you know, where there's boxes around everything, you know, person, person, Starbucks, and so forth, where the computer has recognized all this stuff in the image. So I figured, you know, how hard could it be to just recognize the diamonds <laughs> <laughs> they don't have that much variation. Well, you know, I'm not a computer vision person. And and in the end, I ended up with this thing, which is actually a manual, semi-automated way of tagging the data. Now, this one, it's got all these numbers, 102, 127. Those are all just local IDs that have been made up. So if I create a new diamond, you know, like here, uh, there, you know, 134 or something, and I can move it around, but, you know, I'll just get rid of it because there's nothing there. So all these diamonds down here, I labeled by hand. Uh, <laughs> um, but we can we can watch the whole thing run. So th uh, this thing has now already been. So the idea is I label the births and deaths of where everything starts out, and the tracking tries to keep track of the diamonds as they move. And it does an okay job, you know, but if, if we, uh, we can rewind it. Uh, and so, th so this is what it looks like. Most of what's going on there is 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 tracking that the computer vision that I wrote is doing. Uh, you can see in various places it, it, it doesn't track very well. Like this thing keeps getting the wrong size. It turns out that down in Lotus Four, for whatever reason, uh, things are much more finicky. Uh, the, <laughs> the diamond tracking keeps losing the grid and flying away and so on. In any event, I've now gotten uh, 20 days uh, worth of data labeled and produced into spreadsheets and CSV files so that I can start answering the questions about lifetimes and fertility and all of that stuff. So that took a ton of time. Uh, 
and refreshing my Python, uh, so much so that now that I've gone back to Ulam, I keep forgetting my uh, declarations and semicolons, you know, thanks, Python. Uh, uh, okay, so that's that. Uh, um, and uh, finally, uh, companionate caring. Uh, um, this, is, this is the book I've been talking about on and off for months and months and months, written by my dad. And here it is. Uh, uh, you know, we've actually got uh, a couple of copies that have been printed and sent to us. This just came Saturday, I think. Uh, um, and, and here's my dad there. <laughs> he died in 2008. He was a philosopher, an ethical philosopher. And, and this was kind of his uh, magnum opus, really. Uh, um, and so I thought, I thought I'd just read a little quote from it so to get you the idea. Now, of course, folks that are following the T2 projects are not necessarily ethical philosophers, but I think we are a fairly special crowd, actually. Uh, uh, so let me do this. This is from the, the end of Chapter 2, a section called Ethics as Networking. I already like it. Uh, uh, okay. We are morally estranged from our classical tradition. We no longer share its moral ideals, perfectionism, absolute goods, hierarchically organized society, personality conceived as a struggle between reason and feelings. But this does not mean we are immoral. We have a different set of values. It is not so much that we have rejected traditional values as that they have gradually become irrelevant to our lives, our hopes, and our problems. The society in which they originated no longer exists. So that's, that's my dad. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and, you know, at the moment, uh, I've got copies printed, but it's not in Amazon, Walmart, uh, um, Barnes and Noble and so forth. Uh, uh, so we can't buy it and it's super expensive. I'm pricing it at 25 bucks, uh, uh, for this, you know, little thing. Uh, um, it's, it's not about the, the, uh, uh, price per page. It, <laughs> it's about wanting to, to know some more of the background and, and maybe being interested in, in that. And, and mostly from my point of view, it's just about having, uh, having my dad's stuff out there. I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of him. Uh, uh, and so that's it. Uh, next month, April 4th, um, the A-Life paper will have been submitted long before that, like six days from now. But we're hopefully we're going to get coordinated movement. Let's see if we can get the fins on the fish to stick to the fish uh, um, and actually be able to buy a copy, not in physical stores necessarily, but online uh, um, and have lots more big fun. And that's it. And thanks so much for uh, dropping in, and I hope to see you in a month.